so it's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. And um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about why we need women in data science. Margot already did it, but I will just repeat it. Then I'm going to talk about why women should want to be in data science. Then I'm going to talk about women at Harvey Mudd, because we're one of the few science and engineering institutions where there are women everywhere. And then I'm going to talk, I'm going to t finish by telling you a story of my younger sister, who is 63, who is learning computer science and data science right now, uh, which I think is pretty cool. OK, so um, why does data science need women? I think there are three reasons. One is, these are amazing career opportunities. They pay well. They're flexible. I mean, why wouldn't we want women to have those kinds of opportunities as well as men? Number two, this is the demand for people who have knowledge and skills in data science is growing faster than the demand for pretty much anything else. And we will not meet that demand in this country or in any of the countries around the world where there's a WIDS event happening unless we have women there. And number three, which is what Margot just said so eloquently, most of the major issues that face our world today, data science is going to be one of the tools that helps to address them. And if we don't have a wide range of perspectives and experiences in the people who are working on those tools, the decisions that get made will not be nearly as good. So we need women and people of color and LGBTQ plus people. We need people from all faiths and religions working in this space. OK. Now, we have some women here. Why should you want to be in data science? Just amazing career opportunities. Hi, Julia. This is one of my former students. Um, number two. I think most women that I know actually want to make a difference in the world. You know, they want to do something with their lives where they can see that they're making the world better. And this is just a tremendous opportunity to do that. But number three is, and this is one uh, that is really particularly relevant to me. So I'm 66, and I uh, set out to be a mathematician. Um, I loved math. I also love art and a lot of other things, too. But I especially love math. And so I got my PhD in mathematics in um, 1977. And at that point, about 9% of the PhDs went to women in math. And you know, I love to do research. I love to teach. So I was going to be a math professor. Except that there were 1,000 people looking for jobs as math professors. And there were 83 positions available in all of the US and Canada. And only probably about a quarter of those 83, like maybe 20, were actually tenure track positions. The rest of them were visiting positions, perhaps two years. And I was lucky enough to get one of those positions. My advisor was so proud of me. Well, then I started that position. It was at a place called Oakland University that's north of Detroit. And I hated it. Um, I was teaching you know, linear algebra and advanced calculus to students who had difficulty adding fractions. It was not a good experience. And I was also single, and I was very lonely. I had one date in the whole eight months I was there. It was with a jerk. I knew he was a jerk before I took the date. But that's how lonely I was. So I was, going to conf I was going to a conference every month just as a way to have some kind of you know, like social experience. And one of the things I found out was that um, you know, here I was. I had solved three 20-year-old problems in my thesis. I thought it was pretty hot stuff. And I was teaching students who couldn't add fractions. 
And I found out that there were people getting their PhDs in theoretical computer science, which did exactly the same kind of mathematics that I love to do. And they were getting offers from Harvard and MIT. And, and I went, life is just not fair. And the person I was talking to said, there's this guy, Andy Yao. He got his PhD in theoretical physics from Harvard with a Nobel laureate. And then he did his postdoc at Stanford with another Nobel laureate. And he realized that his chance of getting a faculty position in theoretical physics was basically zero. So he went and he got a second PhD in computer science from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Now, Andy Yao in 2004 won the Turing Award. Um, he's currently, um, like, he lives in China and he's currently sort of the, the Chinese god of computer science, theoretical computer science. And I went, I could do that. I could do a second PhD. So one year after I finished my math PhD, I started at the University of Toronto, which was then and is still now one of the top 10 computer science departments in North America. And they hired me as a faculty member within nine months of my starting my second PhD as a regular tenure track faculty member. So the moral of this story is, if you get into a field like data science today that is on the rise, you will have opportunities throughout your career because there'll never be enough people of your age. And I had that tremendous good luck. I, um, I moved into theoretical computer science. I still have stayed in the math community for my career. I married a young theoretical computer scientist, Nick Pippinger, uh, shortly after um, I started at the University of Toronto. And we have worked, we've been able to work at the same institution for our entire 38 years of being married. First of all, IBM Research, then the University of British Columbia, then Princeton University, and now Harvey Mudd College. When you go into a rising field, you have opportunities, unlimited opportunities for the rest of your life. So I feel incredibly lucky that Andy Yao did what he did. He's, by the way, he's a good friend of mine. Um, because if he hadn't done that, probably nobody would have told me to go get a second PhD in computer science. And did I ever get that second PhD? No. <laughs> did I need a second PhD? I didn't need a second PhD. I just needed to understand enough about computer science that I could teach it and do research. Okay. So now let me talk. So that's why you should be really thinking, male or female, about going into data science. And I was talking to my son yesterday. So my son works for Square in New York City, and he does, uh, he does a mix of data science and software engineering. He's a technical lead on their mobile, uh, their information security for their team for their um, mobile platform. And he says, I told him what I was going to say in this talk. He says, Mom, are you sending him a message? Um, he's definitely, he's a great software engineer, but he loves data science, and he's definitely headed in that direction. Okay, so women at MUD. Um, at Harvey Mudd College, so first of all, raise your hand if you really don't know anything about Harvey Mudd College. It could be worse. Um, Harvey Mudd College is one of the five undergraduate Claremont colleges. Claremont is about 35 miles east of downtown LA. Um, we are the science and engineering college. We're undergraduate only. We have about 850 students and 100 faculty. And um, we compete with MIT, Caltech, and Stanford for our students. So they're very strong students. They know how to add fractions and subtract them. Um, when I arrived, uh, I've been there for almost 12 years. When I arrived, we were about 30% female in the student body and about 30% female in the faculty. And in the 50 years before I, that Harvey Mudd had been around, there had been two female department chairs, ever. We have seven departments. OK, we're a small place. Um, this year, five of the department chairs are female. And every single one of them is the first woman to hold be the department chair in that department. Last year, actually, six of the seven department chairs were female. But one of them became the first female dean of the faculty, which is our provost equi equivalent. We, 40% of our faculty now are female. And, you know, 
Um, and they're well distributed across all the departments. 50% um, of the students are female. But what's even more impressive is if we look at our physics department and we look at the students who will graduate this year, which will be you know, roughly 23 students or something like that, because we're small, half of them will be women. Actually, if it's 23, it'll be slightly more than half of them will be women. Um, in computer science, we have three majors. There's computer science. That's about 55% women right now. We have CS math, which is a joint major. That's about 45% female, the graduating class this year. And then we have CS math bio, which is 80% female in the graduating class this year. So overall, it's more than 50%. Wasn't that way 12 years ago? 10% of our CS majors were female. And one thing I want to make really clear is the fact that we also are typically between 40 and 55% female in our engineering major. These numbers are the highest in the country. And the thing I want to make clear is that our secret sauce is our faculty. Definitely not me. We have faculty who care more about educating our students than about anything else in their life. And so our, the, I'll just say, I, you know, while I was at Princeton, I taught the second semester of calculus, which was the uh, semester that most engineering students take. And I will say, in our first, our students in the first half a semester at MUD, they take the equivalent to what Princeton does in the first three semesters. So the curriculum is really intense and very rigorous. But what we do is we tell all of our students that every student will succeed if they work hard and get help. And we provide enormous amounts of support for our students. And the result is, and we also legitimize that it's really OK to learn something that's hard for you. In fact, we all should be learning things that are hard for us, because you learn so much more about learning when you do something that's really hard for you. So I happen to be particularly uncoordinated. Actually, my husband is more uncoordinated, so our kids are even worse than me. Um, but I have learned to juggle four balls. I have learned to ski. I have learned to ride a skateboard. I have even learned to compete in a Dancing with the Stars competition at the Claremont Colleges. That was the hardest one. Now let me talk about the fact that it's never too old to learn. So I have a younger sister, as I said. Her name is Katrina. She is quite seriously, um, she has a very, she has fibromyalgia. So she suffers from an enormous amount of pain. She walks with a walker. Um, and uh, she actually has a PhD in religion and anthropology from Emory University and taught at a university um, in religion and anthropology for several years. And uh, eventually, her, the pain and, um, just, and fatigue became too much, and so she couldn't do it anymore. So three years ago, she started studying computer science at the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology. OK, the other students in her classes are between 18 and 24. And then there's Katrina with her walker. So she has just created her own company. And she's working on an app called Fiber Me, which is an iPhone app so that you can, if when you have fibromyalgia, that you can record what is happening. And then she's working on analyzing that data using machine learning to detect where the patterns are so that people with this disease can have a better sense of what works for them and what makes it worse. And you know, she had not done any math since high school. She never took math when she was in college. She's getting A pluses. It's pretty spectacular. I claim that she's the mascot for Nate <laughs> because you know they don't have any other students anything like her. Um, she has a mentor now. She has actually her name of her company is Creativity uh, .ca, spelt with a K because Katrina, her first name is spelt with a K. I am so proud of her. And it, so the thing that I want to communicate to all of you is 
it doesn't really matter whether you think you're good at math or good at computer science. That's not relevant. If you want to make an impact in this world, learning something that is challenging for you, learning the tools, the basic concepts, and developing the skills to use the tools of data science, you can do it. And you're going to hear from some amazing women today who have been doing exactly this. And the single most important thing to me that you take away from this conference, and I want to thank Margot and Karen and Judy and all the others who made it possible, the single most important thing is you need to be able to encourage not only yourself to take the risks and to put yourself out there to learn new things, but everyone around you. And you know, really, the secret sauce at MUD is we work hard, we encourage, we support, we care about each other. So thank you very much. Have an absolutely fantastic day here. Um, be educated, be inspired, and be ready to go out there and change the world. Thank you.